Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Well, what a great day we have today. He's got a wonderful word from the word for us today. For those of you who are our guests and haven't been with us, we're on a journey in the book of Colossians where the Apostle Paul, who was locked in a dungy old prison cell, had a real love affair for people he'd never met. And he really wanted those people to have a right relationship with God. And so he spent a long time writing a wonderful letter to that faith family. And that letter is as relevant today as it was to those people back then. And he began to tell them all about how wonderful the Lord is and how great God that we have and how that really to know God we know Him through Christ. And so he spent a time helping those people to develop an intimate relationship with the Lord. And he knew where he was going because the Holy Spirit was leading him to write this so we would have it for today. We need to have that right relationship with God and when we have that right relationship with Him, we often then can have a better or a right relationship with other people. And not just knowing about the Lord and having a right relationship with Him and how to have one is helpful. It's once we know that and then we embrace Him. And once we place our faith alone in Him, here's what happens. When I come to Him and I say, I need you, Lord. I'm a sinner. I have failed in relationships. I failed in life. But I need to have a new beginning and I'm looking to you, Lord. And the Lord looks down upon us and he says, I'm willing to forgive you of all your sin. And if you place your faith in me, I will regenerate you. I'll have you born again. You'll be a brand new creature in me. And when you trust Christ as Savior, God kind of remakes you again. That's where that reborn, that rebirth comes in, that born again. But also he does more than just reborn us. He then comes inside of us so that he could live his life out through us. Often we call that the exchange life. We exchange our old ways and we put that to death and we have the new life in Christ and we allow Him to live out that new life. And there's no one who knows better about relationships than the Lord. Because think about it for a moment. You have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three separate entities, all one, and yet they are all together in unity as we look at the Trinity and deity. And so now we're a partaker of that same relational harmony inside of us. So as we now go to his principles, then we can have that same kind of relationships with other people. And so he continues on in chapter 3, teaching us about what we need to do in those relationships. And he begins to tell us what those relationships are. And there's many of them. The first one, he tells us how to live our married lives. And he talks about how to do that in marriage. And he begins by teaching us the principle of unselfishness towards our mate. And so we had a wonderful discussion of what the husbands are to do toward their wives and what the wives are to do in relationship toward their husbands to really show an unselfishness toward one another. And then he moves into the family and how to have a good relationship at home. And we studied that about how that parents are to relate better to their kids and what's necessary for them to do. And then again, how kids are to relate better to mom and dad. And there's some great teaching on that because it talks about how to have a caring family. And it means that all entities in that family need to be working on this based upon their resources in Christ. Well, now we're into a new section, and that is how do we live our life at work? And that that means that we need to be loyal toward our fellow workers. Now, as I teach this material to you, I'm very cognizant of the fact that this could be a list of things to do, like a simple little formula, like a little menu. And yeah, there are principles, and there are in Scripture, so I'll be teaching it biblically. But you need to know that the source of these principles still come from the person of Christ who lives inside of you. And as you allow him to live these principles out through you, they're very, very doable. Now, as I talk about the world of work in which you live, let me find out from some of you. How many of you right now are an employee? You have a job. Would you raise your hand? How many of you are employees? Would you raise your hand? Great. How many of you as an employee also have people who work for you or report back to you? Would you raise your hand? Okay. Now, you young people, they're sitting over here and they're saying, well, I really don't have a job. Would you look up here for just a moment, teens? Because I want you to engage in this message and it's going to be a double help for you. First of all, you probably don't have a regular job where you're mainly paid. Now, some of you might get an allowance from mom and dad and you might occasionally, if you wash the car, do something extra, get a little bit of extra money. But I'd like to make it a little bit more like real work for you. And that would be like going to school, even if you're homeschooled. Some of you, you have what are known as classwork. That's stuff you do in class. 
Some of you have homework. How many of you have homework when you go to school? Not now. I know you're in the summer. That's called homework, class work. And that's underneath the umbrella called school work. So as I give these principles, I want to pretend that you're paid to go to school. I bet you wish you were so you could get some extra money, and you're not. But while you're at school, I want you to think of yourself as an employee and that your teachers, plural, happen to be your supervisor or your boss. So you'll, in, you'll get this information from them. Now, secondly, I'm looking at our teens here that you are old enough now that it won't be long before you will have little part-time jobs that you'll not only do things for mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and all that, but you might have some little jobs you can do for some of your neighbors, walk their dog, maybe help in their yard, some of that type of stuff. So very soon you will have an employer, maybe just for one little job and maybe an ongoing thing that you go regularly, but you will have some work. So if you would get these truths into you now, do you know that you'll be so far ahead of other kids in how do you work for someone else? And remember this phrase, if you ever want to be in authority, in other words, you want to be the boss, you want to be the manager, you want to be the supervisor, in order for you to be in authority, you have to learn to work under authority. So you're at that stage right now where God is grooming you to have people work under you. So you have to learn how to work now under them. So that's where you are. Now, some of you might be out there and you'll be thinking, well, Stan, you don't really know what I go through because you have a nice cushion job. You get, you get paid to read the Bible. You get paid to preach. And so for you, that's, that's so simple. Well, let me take you a little bit through some of my history for just a moment. I have had all sorts of work. I've worked for un, non-Christians, unsaved people. I've worked grunt work as a beach boy carrying lawn, uh, pool chairs, you know, those big chairs that they have by the pool. Today, they're mostly in aluminum. When I was a boy, they were all made out of heavy redwood, and twice a year we would have to dip these redwood lounge chairs in vats of, of uh, red stain and pull them out, hundreds of these. So we worked very hard, and I did that when I was 15 and 16. I then washed windows and screens for a job. I threw newspapers. One time our family needed money and there was no work, so I ended up borrowing someone's pickup truck and then going door to door asking if I could pick up their trash and get paid for it. So for about a year and a half, I picked up garbage, threw it in the back of the pickup truck, took it to the dump, and shoved it off the back of the pickup truck at the dump, and only to do that again. I had that kind of job. And then for those of you that say, you, you might work for someone else, it's always easier to work for someone else than it is to work for a family member or in a family business. My dad was a painting contractor, and so the heritage of the Pons family was that you were to become a painter as well. And so I worked for a painting contractor, and I worked for my dad. And, I had, and my dad, has, his, his assistant was my older brother. So not only did I work for a dad, I worked for two bosses, my dad and my older brother. I know the tension of a family business as well. And then for some of you that say, well, you don't know what it's like to work for a board where you don't have one person you report to, you report to a battery of guys that have all different personalities. I've been in nonprofit organizations. I worked for churches that had changing heads all the time, so I know what that's like. And then I've also had people that have served under me, so I've had to give them some, some um, uh, direction. Now, I'm not saying that to be colorful. It's not about me. I could go through the things I did wrong, things that I did right. I just want you to know I've been touched in similar the wild bit of work. I've worked for a law firm, by the way, so you know that I also worked in some professional settings as well where you had to act a little bit differently there. Now, that being said, I wanted you to know that from this context here, that the lifestyle of Christianity that God wants us to live is not only a Christianity that works in the home, that won't only work just in the church, it's a lifestyle that we live 24-7, which would also include the world of work in which we live. Most of you raised your hand that you have a job. I could have asked how many of you wish you had a job. And maybe if I said how many of you wish you had a better job, more hands would even go up. I don't know. But I know this that the principles that we're about to learn are not going to deal with the problems on the job like personality clashes or you don't have a clear job description or probably a, an overbearing boss or something. The principles that we're about to learn from the passage of Scripture today are character truths. In fact, I believe most of the things that we encounter on our job are more spiritually related than they are merely economically related. Those that have a trouble working under an authority figure, you will find that eventually they will have a characteristic that they will go from one authority figure to another authority figure to another authority figure and they keep looking for a better job or looking for a better place or a different authority figure because they're having a difficult time because they haven't fully learned how to surrender to the authority figure of God through their authority figures. And I want to help you through all of that so that you can live Christianity on your job without you feeling like to be a Christian on your job. Are you saying, Pastor, I've got to jump up on my desk and preach Jesus or get on the back of my pickup truck and tell all the men they ought to go to heaven by trusting Christ? No, it's not that at all. That's only a tiny little part 
It's first building a case for Christianity. Can you all hear me all right in the back? You cannot hear me? Can you crank that up a little bit more? Just a little more. How about that? A little hotter? A little hotter? If we can't, then you know what I'll do? I'll walk up and down the aisles and I'll preach to you back and forth. That's what I'll do. All right. With that all in mind, I want to talk about the world of work again. It means being loyal to my fellow workers. So the first key word for slaves, and I put the word employees there. Some of you might be chomping at that. I'm not a slave. I'm an employee. And how does this all fit into that? Now, those of you that want a little background, when Paul was writing this, do you know that in the city of Colossae, it was estimated by scholars that almost half of the people in that little city of Colossae were slaves. And most of those slaves actually lived in families as family settings. But in those days, they often took care of their slaves. They weren't mean to slaves like a lot of times we see on TV and shows like that. So the slave was a part of the family member. That's why the, the idea of, of, of employment and slavery and masters is put in the same context as families. But I want you to know that I don't want you to see yourself as merely a slave. Look at yourself as an employee. Now, as we look at that, you have a key word as an employee. And that's the word Lord. And I'll explain what that means. When you really focus that on your job as an employee, if you keep one thing in front of you, that is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those of you that are taking notes, let me again tell you how critical this passage we're studying is today. Do you know that when the Apostle Paul spoke to relationships, he actually gave more verbiage to employer-employee relationships than he did with family relationships? I thought that was quite interesting. It's quite possible that how we function on our job could be what we bring back home as baggage into our home that could cause some stress in our jobs. You know, our, the, the husband goes off to work, he's got a bad problem at work, he comes home and he unloads on the family. The wife has had stressful on the job, she's also a mother as well, and that kind of comes into the home. I don't know, but I do know that there's a solution for all of this, and it's really good. Now, you've had the passage that was read to you, so I don't need to go over that passage right now for you. But what's the responsibility of an employee? That's a good question. What am I really supposed to do? Now, I'm sure if you are in a professional job, they often have a job description and they have a flow chart and they have a job um, uh, management level, uh, uh, a chart of who's in charge kind of thing. But what are your responsibilities? Well, here it says bond servants, obey in all things your masters. The word bond servant is a servant who's choosing to work for a master. It's not someone who is merely captured and made to do this. This is one who says, I want you to be my master. So this person has chosen to have a master. Here it says, obey in all things your masters. Now, the phrase all things, we could talk about what happens if they ask you to do something like lie or steal or to fudge on accounts or paperwork you have to do. Obviously, you have to take the high road and do what is right before the Lord. But most of the time, the things that we're asked to do, we feel is not fair because we're asked to do things that someone else isn't asked to do. We feel like it's more personal against us, and that's where we get into trouble. And here it says we're to obey our master in all things. And you're going to see why this opens up in just a moment. Well, the word obey really means to follow the instruction of the person over you. Would you mark that somehow in your notes? I want to really simplify. What does it mean to obey? It means to follow the instruction that you were given by the person that's over you. Now, I don't know that I have time this morning to go through every little nuance about if you have three bosses or divisions or department heads, how do you handle that? We can talk about that in my office later on if you'd like. But for right now, it's to merely follow the instruction of the supervisor that's over you. In other words, you do it his way and not your way unless you get an appeal done. And then you have an agreement. So you're to follow his instruction. Did you know that having a job really is somewhat like a privilege? You have a choice of whether or not you're going to work where you work. Now, you might say, no, I don't. I, I don't have a choice. I can't get another job somewhere else. That's true. You have the choice, though, of either working for that person or quitting or going down on the street. But it's still your choice. There is no one making you work there. If you're under contract because you have signed a contract, there probably is in that contract some bit of an escape clause in there. But if there's not, then you chose to sign a contract with your boss that you're going to do or say or work these many months or years with it. It is a contract. You went into this thing. If it wasn't well thought out and you made a mistake, ask God and he will grant you this. Ask God for all the grace to go through this and he will help you. As I put this down for me, I don't know if this will help you, but here's the privilege. I have the privilege to work because it helps me earn a livelihood and provide for my family. Do you know that it's really good that I have a job because now the work that I have, I can provide for my family. 
I don't know if Grandma Mac is here. Yes, she is. She and Richard work in our finance office here. And nearly every time that uh, they hand me the check that I'm given for my compensation, the labor is worthy of his hire, I've come to the point to tell them what a great privilege that I have to work here. And that I'm grateful that I get paid, but I would come here and work even if I didn't get paid. Now, you didn't hear that, did you? But in reality, I really see myself. I'm enjoying serving you. You are very generous in taking care of us. But really, it is God who is working in my life, in Carol's now, through you all, and I get paid for that. It is a privilege. And so look at yourself that God placed you there as a missionary. God has placed you there for a character-building opportunity. God has given you a ministry there in some measure. It's a privilege to have that job and get paid for it. Also, it gives me an opportunity to serve my fellow man through providing some needed products or service. I was so glad that there was a man who chose to learn how to be a plumber who happened to be near a telephone where his supervisor called him on Thursday morning when water was going everywhere. We shut the main water out, but I had over a dozen people here and they had to go to the bathroom, but there was no water to flush the you-know-what. So I had to get that guy over here to fix the plumbing so we can then use the you-know-what, all right? That being said, this guy added value to me and to all those who were on site that day and all of you today who use the you-know-what since you've been here. Now that guy did something. You on your job is valuable because what you do is adding value to other people in some way. You are connected. Every relationship touches another person's life. And every one of you is important in that. And then to earn enough money to carry the gospel. When I think about the, those of us who are paid, we're paid so that it will first of all take care of the basic needs of our family. Not all the technology, bells and whistles and toys, but the basic needs of our family. And then God has given us extra for the purpose for us to be able to give, to help fund other missionaries and other churches like ours to be able to take that message of the gospel. So the way he funds ministry opportunities that need money is by having you and me work so that we get a check so then we can go on and fund Christian work so that we have one big symphony of God's movement going on. So having a job is a part of that. And then number four, to meet the desperate needs of the world. Now, there are some desperate needs, and sometimes those needs need to be met, and it is the gospel, but sometimes it's going to be some physical needs. But how are we supposed to obey our supervisor? Out of this passage alone, I think there are four truths that we could learn. Again, they're all rooted in the person of Christ who is there inside of us, giving us the power, the strength, and will live it out through us. Here it is. He should work faithfully, even when he is not being seen. Kids... You're to do your homework, even if your teacher isn't watching you or your mom or dad isn't watching you. You should be doing your homework, even when you get home and they're still at work and they want you to get your homework done first, whatever their priority list is, you do it and you're going to do it faithfully. It says, not with eye service as men please. In other words, you don't do it just when the boss is looking. You do it even when the boss isn't looking. So we're to do it faithfully. It means we're to be doing what we're instructed to do. We're to do what's expected of us to do and we should be producing at the end of our day, we should look back and say, have we added to what was supposed to be done today? And then do more than what's instructed, more than what's expected, and more than what we can even produce. Secondly here, he should work purposely with focused attention. Work purposely. In other words, when you're in the job, you give it 100%. You give it your focused attention. It's not trying to do two or three things at once. I know maybe your job requires you to keep a couple plates spinning, maybe more. But it is all about the job. When you're at work, you're at work. Would you say that with me? When I'm at work, I'm at work. One more time. When I'm at work, I'm at work. And so kids, when you're at school, I don't know what they permit you to do or not, but I pray that when you're at school that you're not trying to do other stuff to set up other meetings, other fun stuff, texting other kids, etc., that when you're at school, you're all focused at school. When you're at work, it's about school. You work purposely from a sincere, pure heart, knowing that God knows your motives of why you're doing this. Number three, he should work respecting the Lord. The word fearing the Lord doesn't mean you're scared of the Lord, but it does mean that you know that God is watching. And you know that you will have to give an account of your attitude to your employer, your attitude towards your work, your attitude toward even working for whatever reason, and that the quality of work that you're doing. You're to do it respecting the Lord. And then the fourth one is he should do it diligently. It says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. Boy, how important that is. I'm reminded of a story that I was told many years ago. 
about a, a building contractor that wanted to build a house for himself. And so he asked his son-in-law, his future son-in-law, who worked for him, if he would take on the project of building this house for the owner, this contractor. He said he was too busy, he got other projects going, so he gave the job to his son-in-law and said, or his future son-in-law, would you now build this house for me? So the future son-in-law, he got the plans out and the future father-in-law was out doing his things in construction, other big buildings. So this future son-in-law decided that he was going to surprise his future father-in-law and try to save some money on this job. He looked at the plans and the plans required that the nails be put apart 18 inches. He decided to do it 24 inches. It talked about certain thickness of plywood. He got a little thinner plywood. It talked about certain layers of shingles on the roof. He did one less layer of shingles on the roof. It talked about priming and then a second coat of paint. He decided to just put one thick coat of paint on and not priming it. And he got it done ahead of time and he got it done also for a lot less money. And boy, was he so happy because he could now show to his new father-in-law that he could save money and he could get this thing done in a sooner amount of time. And so as he did this, he now says to his father-in-law, I want you to know this is the house that I built for you. Thank you for entrusting me with the plans and to build this house for you. So the father thanked him. Two weeks later, the wedding came on. And now they're at the reception. And so the father's about ready to give a toast. So he clangs his little glass and everybody is quiet. And the father-in-law says how proud he is of his son-in-law. And you know the rest of the story. He handed the keys to that house to his new son-in-law and said, Thank you, the house you thought you were building for me is a house that you built for yourself. And you can imagine what went on in his mind because he knew that he was cheating his father-in-law and now he has an inferior house that he built. Well, in our world of work, we could get by, some of us for many years. In fact, most of us probably can get so smart at cutting corners that we can get around this for the rest of our life because so many people do it and even bosses kind of expect us to do it. But in reality, God is up in heaven and He knows exactly what's expected out of us. Do you know that they know that there is so much pilfering when an employee works in a clothing industry like some of our department stores at the mall that they know that people are shoplifting, even the fellow workers are doing that, that they inflate the prices over it, not because of customers who come in and shop and steal. It would be from their own employees that do it. So you and I, when we go to the mall and we buy something and we pay so much money, they're factoring in because their own employees are thieves. And that translates into those of us who aren't in the uh, real t retail business. Paper clips, copy machines, and all the rest. And what we need to do is to work diligently, faithfully, purposely, respectfully and diligently as unto the Lord. Now, why should we do that? There's two reasons. Let's look at the two reasons why we should. Diligent work will be rewarded by the Lord. Would you mark that down? That when you serve the Lord from the inside out, according to His power and grace and for His glory, and you know that He's watching you, when you do it that way, God says, I will reward you. Now, here's what we have to be careful of. And it's hard. Sometimes we do work hard and we'll put in extra hours. Maybe we'll work hard for many weeks or months on a project. Some of you have worked very hard on your job and you've received abuse and misuse. Some of you have been passed over for promotion. Some of you know that the good old boys club is going on on your job. Some of you have been marginalized on your job because they may know that you're a Christian. Some of you might have an ethnic issue that's going on in your job that's working against you. Some of you know that there's favoritism that have been there. And I know that that stuff will demoralize anyone. That will affect and impact our flesh. That's a normal thing to do. That's normal. That's natural. But God doesn't want us to be normal and natural. He wants us to be spiritual and supernatural. That's why He lives out within us. Because there's no one who's known more abuse than the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet He still finished His Father's work and He fulfilled His Father's will. And so just like he did to his father in obedience, no matter what the world did to treat him, no matter how bad he was treated, he still could die and rise again. And this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And he could say that to you and me as well. So you will be rewarded of the Lord. It says here, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. So the next time you look at your boss for just a moment, if you could just picture instead of your boss, your supervisor, picture the Lord Jesus Christ giving you that assignment. You young people, when you're given an assignment from your teacher, you look at it as if it's the Lord giving you that assignment. And when you turn it in, it's like you're handing it to the Lord. And He's now not going to just look at 
what you did on your paper. He's going to look at the attitude in which you did it. He's going to look at the extra mile that you went, that you did this. He's going to see if you did it for His glory. And sure, the teacher's going to be grading you. And watch this. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.